if you even take the time in some scripture that looks to be out there somewhere of insignificance to your life, but if you start to study that word, you'll see God begin to bubble things to the surface you've never seen before. And all that he is doing in every line in the word is he is exposing himself in a much deeper way into that way to impact your confidence in who he is and demonstrate in vivid imagery and vision so that our faith will grow because the word of God is the means of that faith and its growth. So when we're reading the Bible, this is why just speed reading through it doesn't do it, but just just stopping along the way and letting the Holy Spirit dig in that shovel and begin to, to excavate down through the strata of this word is amazing. And the more you study it, the more in all of who Christ is. And even in his creation, and I'm learning this more and more, is, is that when he says that the creation declares the glory of God, everything in create this, everything that you see, God created is literally screaming out, there is a creator and it does it in depth. If we stop to smell the roses for a moment. The things that are tucked away in nature even, that literally when you look at it, and the more you look at it, all of a sudden it becomes more clear, and it's like the gospel even comes out of nature. <laughs> Amen. The only reason that the world doesn't see it is because they're blind. But we're walking, I know we talk about how evil the world is, and certainly it is. Certainly we understand the prince and power of God. We understand that. But I'm telling you, God is such a force to be reckoned with. Everywhere you turn, you can see him in manifestation. And this is what I'm about to share with you to encourage your faith, because this is not so much the, 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 the message tonight that's going to lead into one, uh, is, is this, this thing called the crimson grub. And the reason why it is called the crimson grub or scarlet worm is because of its color. It happens to be a deep red. It is the color of blood, this worm. And so when you, they are plentiful in Palestine, they're plentiful in Israel. They are, they are known there unlike here and they carry a significance. Let me share you something and why Jesus said, I am a worm. It's because when the female crimson worm is ready to lay her eggs, never read this, never saw this. This is facts. This is true biology, Okay. The crimson worm, when she is ready to lay her eggs, which only happens once in her life, period. At that moment, through instinct, God created, instinct, when she knows she's giving, ready to give birth, she will climb up a tree or a fence post. She will attach herself to it. And with her body attached to that wood, as she is attached, a hard, and she does this, she now begins to spin out a hard crimson shell around her body. It is a shell that is so hard and so secured to the wood, it can only be removed by tearing apart the body, which would then kill the worm. Now watch this. The female worm lays her eggs under her body, under that protective shell. When the larvae hatch, they remain under the mother's protective shell so the baby worms can feed on the living body of the mother worm for three days. After three days, after three days, the mother worm will die. Her body then excretes a crimson scarlet dye that stains the wood to where she is attached, and it also stains all of her babies. It is, so, it is such a dye that that crimson color will stay on those babies for their entire lives. 
Thereby, they are from that moment on identified for their entire life as crimson worms. <laughs> it's, this is amazing to me. I wanted to shout. Well, glory. I, and see, there's no accident with Jesus. Oh, I'm a worm. Well, it means nothing. It means everything. Because then he's expecting me, expecting you to go back and study and say, now, nah, I'm going to reveal to you through the process of birthing with this insect, and you're going to see what I'm doing. Yes. And Jesus is going to mark us and mark us with the blood that, that isn't removed. It identifies us as his children. Whew. <laughs> it doesn't stop there. On day four, the tail of the mother worm pulls up into her head and literally forms a heart-shaped body that is no longer crimson. Her body, not the baby's. Her body is no longer crimson. It will turn into a snow-white wax that looks like a patch of wool on the tree or the fence, it bent, then begins to flake off, drop to the ground, looking like snow. And the babies leave the shell and for a little while feed on the white flakes like the manna that fed Israel. <laughs> and you think a man inspired this Bible? You've out of your mind. That's a divine mind. Now you're going to see when you look at Psalm, one, or I'm sorry, Isaiah 118. He says, come now, let us reason together, say the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. <laughs> I can't hardly take it. This is why I put extra deodorant on tonight. In biblical times, I don't even know where I'm, I'm getting lost. I'm going up there in a minute. In biblical times, this is what they use to dye, even in the high priest garments. This is the dye they would always use in worship was this particular grub, crimson grub worm. This is what they used in crushing, and this is where they got the red dye symbolizing the very blood of the sacrifice of Jesus. You see... <clears throat> So Jesus, a crimson worm on the cross, when I look at that and, and take it being a little facetious, but on the surface I look at that with a scowl thinking, well, it should be a lion, a lamb, or an anointing oil or something in, in showing that Jesus as this powerhouse. But just like Jesus taking things that are foolish to the wise, but he confounds them with it. And when Jesus says, well, I, he's here coming to the cross, said, I am a worm. And we look at that as insignificant or weak. It becomes the most powerful. Matter of fact, it's even more powerful than the lion. Amen. See, when, when just as the mother worm attached herself to the tree or the fence, Jesus put himself on this wooden cross, a type of tree, and he willingly left those nails to be driven into his hands because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, it wasn't the nails that held him to that cross. It was his love and it was his desire to fulfill the purpose and plan of God to redeem man from sin, according to Galatians 1.4. Just as that mother worm attached her 
yourself to a tree is part of God's desire for the worm's life cycle. So also with God's plan, his design to send his son to be attached to a tree, a wooden cross, to die, according to 2 Timothy 1.9, 1 Peter 1.20. Just as the mother worm, when crushed, excretes a crimson scarlet dye that both covers the baby worms and stains or marks them, Jesus was also bruised and crushed for our iniquities in 53.5 of Isaiah. His scourgings and the nails that were driven into his hands and feet brought forth his crimson scarlet blood that both washes away our sins in Revelation 1.5 and marks us as his own, specifically said in Ephesians 2.13. I mean, this is an amazing thing. Finally, just as the baby worm is dependent on the mother worm for the crimson dye to give it life and mark it, a, or to mark it, a repentant sinner must depend on the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, receive new life, and to be marked as his known as his own in Acts chapter 4 verse 12 1 Peter 1 18 through 19 it is nothing but the precious blood of Jesus and so now we're not looking at that as something insignificant now when we look at that a worm said oh this is not just some old earthworm this is this is something that has such a value and purpose and significance to the understanding of of the power of what Christ has did for, has done for us you see when we come to this and I look at this when we have this great power we're going to first John now we have this great power that is behind us covering us in us through us on top of us surrounding us as an aurora, as an atmosphere. The anointing is pervasive from the top of our head to the very soles of our feet. We learned on uh, Sunday as, as Jesus Christ, we, you know, we wonder, I mean, that spirit lives inside of us. That's who's in this temple right now is Jesus Christ who is, who is projected by the very person or by the person of the Holy Spirit. The Bible doesn't lie. The Bible tells us he lives in us, the hope of glory. And so we carry that when we extend our hand. It's not just our hand being extended. It's the anointing of God that's being offered to somebody who can receive it by faith. It's not that my hand on the head, as we were showing with shame uh, on Sunday, when my hand touches that head or your hand touches, lay hands on the sick. There's no value in the sense of power in the blood and the veins of, of Reuben's hand. It's not that. All God wants is an instrument to be used. And when you lay your hand there, and then it becomes even more than a symbolic gesture. There is a person, there is a power, there is an authority, there is a name that is resonant in your life. And when you speak that name, you release that anointing. And if that person has faith in the name and the authority that you carry, they will receive out of you what you're carrying. This is, this is exemplified clearly in the book of Acts over and over. Jesus set the precedent in three and a half years continuously in four gospels, and he expected the early church to do the same thing. He expected them, you lay hands on the sick, you cast out devils, you, you pick up that cripple, you raise the dead, you do the very things that I do. Why? Because the spirit that lives in me is now inside of you. Do as I do. Amen? And so uh, this is why there's very little whining in the kingdom of God. Some of you thought, oh, you're talking about drinking. No, I'm talking W-H-I-N. Heaven, heaven, in heaven, there's, there's people not complaining. There's nobody complaining there. Nobody walks out in the morning and says, oh, my, it's raining. Nobody walks in, there's, there's no, nobody whines in heaven. There's no stuck solenoids on a starter. It's not even a dead battery there, Crystal. You know, there's this, everybody is joyous. Everybody's off, authentic. Everybody's genuine. Everybody there can be trusted. You could tell somebody anywhere in heaven, you could tell anybody there your deepest secret and, and you would not have to worry about it. I said in heaven. You don't want to do it in church. Now, now that's a sad thing because we're to, we're to replicate, we are to reflect heaven. So what goes on there should go on here. 
I'm really going, we're leading into this. Uh, Jesus saved us with a powerful purpose. But there are some requirements for that purpose to really flourish. And as I said in heaven, there's something in heaven known as, a, as, as unity. <laughs> this is why heaven is so blessed, because it has such unity. What brings that unity is the love of Christ. Now let's look at this. Let's look at this. This is where we're going tonight. In 1 John 1, 7, I like this. When we move into real unity. We don't start by trying to love everybody. <laughs> Matter of fact, if you try to start out loving everybody, you'll end up hating everybody. Because that's not God's way. He says, let's all read together, but if we walk in the light, in the light, as he is in the light. Let's reread that first part again, ready? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we could put the word then, because there's a comma, then we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Before I can love anyone else, before I can have unity with anyone else, I first have to be in love with Jesus. Amen. I have to have unity with him. Because the only way that I can love someone else, sincerely love them, is through him. <laughs> Amen? Amen? The world doesn't know that kind of love. The world, the world loves people based upon things done for them. That is it. It's just the way it is. People, a person will love other people as a benefit to themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. It's conditional. That's right. If, if, if I can't have unity with him then how will I have unity with anybody else? Now, that leads me to something. If I'm always having problems with other people, probably I have a problem with him. Because my problems with others often stem back, there's something wrong in my relationship with him. And it's not him. That's right. So if we want, so the church in this time is facing, we are at this crossroads, I think, in, in America especially, and we talk about this regularly, trying to, try to bring the solution to it, the fixing to it, what's God's solution, how do, we, how do we prepare ourselves so we can be ever stronger in this hour? In this rocking and tremoring and shaking and earthquaking that's going on spiritually and culturally in this country, is, is requiring a kingdom people who literally become unshakable or earthquake proof. So they have to build, God is building his church on a earthquake proof structural foundation. And so what happens is as the world, as it gets wild in its uncouth ways, I will tell you, God will get wild in his miraculous manifestations Amen. that will stretch faith. <laughs> God can heal a headache, but God wants to get us beyond just expecting a headache healed. He wants to see America turned around, which is going to, which is needing and necessitating tremendous miracle demonstration. 
And the only environment that comes out of, it's not a fluke, it's not a voila, it's not a mistake, it's not something you stumble into, it is a purposeful, intentional, guided track by God into and creating an environment that all of this harvest is to come out of. This is what God is doing in this church. He's trying to collect us in and make sure that we create, that he's creating and allowing him to create an environment within us that is conducive to just miracle upon miracle manifestation that astounds the world, not as a light show theatrical situation Hollywood production. He's looking at it to astound, to impact the heart that will gain an access of stunning the the brain of an unbeliever into the admission that something is existing greater than this world. And so when I, my mind kept going back and going back and going back to this, to this psalm that, that uh, is really one of my favorites in the sense, because I see the impact, not because I see it of intellectual, it's simply that God has opened the window to this. In, in looking at this down through the last 24 or 5 years in ministry and got this message here at times would revisit and see the impact of this because in Psalm 133:1 and read it with me just read one to start he says behold he really wants to get our attention when he says behold it's basically clapping the hand everybody look up here that's what he's saying. Behold, ready to read it out loud. How good and how pleasant. Oh, isn't it good? How good and how pleasant it is for brethren, not just anybody. For brethren. See, when he says the word brethren, he immediately cuts out compromise. He's not looking at a big tent. He's looking at... Brethren, is there is a type. Yes. Ple pleasant it is for brethren, and then he uses words that I always just stop. Every time I stop, I feast on this. It is for brethren, and then he says this, to dwell. Dwell, dwell is not visitation. <laughs> it's not just a coming and going. Dwell is living it's habitation. Brethren, to dwell together, not just together, but in unity. I mean, it just, this verse itself, just number one, we'll get to two and three in a minute, but, but it's a short psalm, but it, it, it doesn't have to be long. You get, you get these couple verses right, and we're going to be pushing up miracle daisies. I know some of you is mad. You, th well, you just called us dirt. Well, <laughs> this verse certainly expresses what when you start out? He expresses the joy, the joy that results in brethren being united, doesn't it? Joy. Would you, would you agree that joy should be seen, heard, and manifested? Which also says joy is not just to be reduced down to a smile on the face or a hyena laugh. Joy is a demeanor even long after we've left church. It is. It is, it is our strength. Even that when they was going, Nehemiah and all of them was going through hard times, he said, look, we need to remind ourselves the joy of the Lord is our strength. Do you know we should have such joy that, that people become attracted? In other words, we should not be, our personality should not be a repellent. Like bug spray. Raid. We shouldn't be spiritual Raid. The word, I'm sorry. The word good, when he says good, good and how pleasant, is, is fairly general rending, rendering, 
But, but the psalmist's idea here is proper. How proper it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How fitting, how right it is for God's people to be one. So it gives you a little bit of a twist, a little bit of different perspective. This is what he's saying. Not just good, it is good, but it's proper. It's fitting that God's people, God's people would be one. And the word pleasant here, how pleasant, has the sense of what I just said, attractive. It's attractive. How pleasant has the sense of attractive. How attractive, charming, lovely it is when God's people dwell as one. (laughs) Together, look at the word together. Together, salvation is not a journey all the way to heaven alone. We should be happy about that. It's not an alone journey. Now, Satan, one of his, is trying to make people feel like they're on an island. But the the fact remains, we're not alone. You know how you know it? Even great prophets of old, Elijah himself, at one time, thought he was the only worshiper, servant of the Most High. And God had to remind him in his delusional thought that, no, you're not There's seven other thousand people who likewise have not bowed their knee to Baal. So I've got good news for us. We're not the only one. Amen. Amen. Yes, there's more, there's more of us, amen? And so we're not alone. Now, to get, it's not a journey alone. Dwell together, dwell together. This is one that is, that is often misunderstood, People think that just being together is what God is referring to. Uh, People can dwell together and never experience unity. You, 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 I mean, you can have, you got a lot of things that are written with it, you know it. And there's a lot of people who have the same last name. And they're not in unity, but they live together. Same address. You can have 20 people sitting together in a break room at a business every day and not be in unity. A gathering does not mean unity. There's there's more churches than not that are filled up on Sunday morning every week and are not in unity. And that's the reason why no miracles. Because you, we can't have unity if we haven't first had unity with Christ. So the love of God can't be displayed where it hasn't been experienced, even by the individual. And he said, if you're going to have fellowship, you've got to love me first, then you can love others. You see, unity is more than a gathering of bodies in one place. Anointing, according to this even, anointing depends upon unity. Oil is poured upon the head first and then down on the body. If, if a member becomes separated from the body, it dies and ceases to function, loses its ability. It must remain connected to remain functional and receive nourishment and blessing. Unity is not based on programs. It's based on relationship. Amen? You can have business unity. Some relationships are connected by you have what I need and I have what you need. This is a relationship that's built on business. It's not trading together and doing business with each other and promoting each other's programs. It is esteeming one another beyond ourselves. Once I start esteeming others more than myself, unity is then achieved. Amen? Externals cannot exceed the emotional aspect of a person in producing change in the heart. The beauty of the church building will not pr- produce commitment in the heart. In three months, it wears off, and it's just another building. I've seen that here. We renovated times, you know. People got excited. It is exciting. I mean, I get excited. We all do. But we found out that 
I remember in the second renovation of this church, it was the major renovation of the, even the second story and all this here some years back. And uh, I remember the church staying full for a while. Then it just, whoosh. the reason is the novelty wore off. We come to find out novelty does not produce commitment. It still comes down, I have to have a relationship. People go to sports games because they have football, baseball. They have something in common but not have unity. We can even have things in common but not in unity. It's a little deeper, isn't it? It's not, it's not what we have in common. It's who we have in common that produces unity. Amen. It's a person. In a bar, alcohol is what people have in common. Take it away and the people disperse. Right? You, people go to the bar room for what? They have one thing in common. They like to drink. What's there is alcohol. That's what keeps them together. They are together, but they don't have unity. Because why? They have a thing. The church building, if you take it away, will not disperse the people. Take away alcohol and the bar stops. Take away this building, we continue on. Why? Because it's not the what that gives us unity. It's the who. So you can take the building, take the chairs, take everything else, take the parking lot, sit us in a field, and we'll have church Sunday morning. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> Psalm 133, 2. I'll try to get a caboose on this. Just, just where God is trying to take us here. It, it is like the precious ointment upon the head ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's head, and went down to the skirts of his garment. He, he's likening unity now. He has this, this picture with us. The holy anointing oil consisted of olive oil mixed with four principal spices. I'm not going to belabor the point. But we don't need to here. But the holy anointing consisted of all olive oil mixed with four principal spices, which were myrrh, sweet cinnamon, sweet calamus, and cassia. It was called the holy anointing oil. It was not called myrrh. It wasn't called sweet cinnamon. It wasn't called sweet calamus. It was not called cassia. It was called the holy anointing oil. It was not called by an ingredient. It was called rather by what was produced by those ingredients. Amen? Amen? Does that make sense? The ingredients did not receive the recognition, rather what they had come, what they had become together. This is us. We are ingredients, and when we come together, we really come together, and he is the glue between us. Love is traveling, first of all, between us and him, now between us laterally. Now what is produced is unity. See? And that unity, oil was the base for all the spices to be able to come together. The Holy Spirit is who coordinates. The oil was the base for all of the ingredients to come together. Who is the base for us? The Holy Spirit. Mm. He mixes us all up. <laughs> as the dew of Hermon, verse 3, as, as the dew of Hermon, as the dew that's descended upon the mountains of Zion. This is, I love this, for there, for there, the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. I love that. The dew of Hermon and Zion was plentiful, were plentiful even in dry weather. In the morning, everything was as wet, was wet as if it had rained. Didn't matter if the dry and atmosphere in the valleys didn't matter anything, but the dew of Hermon, the mountains of Zion, and, and, and Zion and Hermon both, in dry weather, it was still wet every morning. In other words, the sinful atmospheres of this world that is dry and arid and parched does not affect the atmosphere in unity. It remains wet with the water of his word. See, what does the word do? And what does that kind? He's a command of blessing. He said the refreshing influence of the worshiping community on the nation 
was similar to the dew on the vegetation. The worshipful experience of the church here in the atmosphere is like the refreshing dew on the vegetation. This is what we can do in this nation. Well, glory to God. There, notice the word there, there, God commanded the blessing. There is where in unity is where the blessing of God is commanded. It is commanded. It, has, it doesn't have a choice. Blessing, blessing does not stand on the sideline and, and say, well, I don't think I'm going in today. It is under the direct command of God, you will touch my people. You will bless them. And blessing is not a mere feeling of euphoria. Blessing is a purpose. Blessing has a power. Blessing is an equipping. Whew. When you walk out of a service and I say, I've been blessed, what does that mean? Hopefully it doesn't mean it just made me feel good. Don't cheapen the blessing of God. When I walk out of a service and I've been blessed means I just got empowered to do what God has commanded me to do. Well, glory. As a matter of fact, when I walked out of that church, the commanded blessing, it was like the dew off of Mount Zion and Mount Hermon. I, matter of fact, I feel like if we go outside and in my daily life and my life is worshiping God, I'm literally touching the vegetation of the sinful world with the power and the anointing of God himself. Hallelujah. Isn't this good? Wow, this even beats being an old dumb sheep. Huh? He's likening you to like just do of Herman and say, I mean, you're, you're, you're mountainous. I can't stand the mountains, but I, I got to like them now. <laughs> why, didn't he, why didn't he command the blessing at the beach? I know. <laughs> well, glory to God. Well, there's other significance there. There's other significance there. Ever see a starfish? What's, what's that ones that? Uh, what's those? What's those ones with a shell that has the um, three in it or something? A sea urchin? No, it's another shell. It's a shell. You break a moment. It symbolizes the uh, Trinity. I'm not sure. Is it clam oyster? Is that what it is? I don't know what it is. Sand dollar. Sand dollars. You break them open, they break out. They're doves. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, interesting. All over the place. Sinner will look at that and say, wow, he does something. Walk away, have no clue. Blind, dumb. But we look at it and realize God's talking. God's talking right there. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, praise God. Can you imagine how we landed 93 million miles from the sun, perfectly tilted on an axis, and, and, and life is sustained here perfectly? Yeah, can you imagine the poor mind that believes that this is all an accident? Something blew up, and an amoeba appeared and spawned through some bacteria in this something. Well, I've seen people I wonder. <laughs> There's some people you wonder where they come from, but they just <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right. Well, praise God. Well, I believe God's teaching us in these last two services. So let's take them to heart. Let it encourage us and continue on. And I'm telling you, folks, keep your eyes open because things are transpiring. Do you believe that? Oh, hallelujah. Yes, he is. It's transpiring. And uh, I'm not going to put any dates on it, but I'm telling you, it's not long. It's not long. Well, let's stand tonight, if you would. <laughs>